Live before a little is live. So this first countdown is just for the crew to get the intro going, and I'll come back and I'll point at you guys and start clapping. And then I'll point to Gina, and you don't pick off the phone. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, For a little to go live. Jump, jump slower. Yeah, since you're following me, we're already live. Fresh cafe. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August edition of Civil Cafe. Uh, I am Gene Park, community manager for uh, CivilBeat.com, uh, Hawaii Investigative News Service. Uh, we uh, are a monthly subscription service, and every month we put together uh, these live events to talk about issues uh, that affect our community. Um, this month, we're going to be talking about homelessness. Um, you know, uh, as, as far as I can recall, uh, we have about 4,700 homeless uh, on a wall alone. Um, I, I recently posted on Sylvie.com that uh, Hawaii has the highest per capita rate of homelessness in the United States, second only to Washington, D.C. Uh, so it's just us in D.C. Uh, right up there, uh, bigger than uh, worse than California. Um, so, you know, this is something that's, that, that's been on the tip of everyone's tongue, you know. Uh, it's, it's just been getting worse and worse, and uh, I, I think uh, there, there's been a lot of conversation about it, and, and that, that's why Civil Beat is very happy to host this. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes, please keep your cell phones off or on silent. Um, the hashtag tonight is uh, civil, hashtag Civil Cafe on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, if you have any questions for the panel, uh, please, uh, you can either tweet us uh, at it and, and I'll read it and I'll read it out by 7 o'clock. Um, we're going to have a QA and a in the first hour uh, with reporter Chad Blair. Um, and at 7 o'clock, we'll take it to you guys. Uh, so please form a line right here uh, once, you, once you start having questions. Um, and uh, I just want to introduce our panel real quick. Uh, we have uh, Colin Kippen. Uh, he's the state coordinator for homelessness uh, for the state of Hawaii. Uh, we have Jun Yang, uh, the housing director for the city and county of Honolulu. We have uh, Jason Aspero, who's the director of Caravan at the Waikiki Health Center. Uh, we, did, we, we originally had Joy Rucker to be here. Uh, she couldn't make it, so we have Mr. Jason Aspero instead. Um, and uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Jerry Coffey with the Institute of Human Services, uh, clinical, clinical director of the Institute of Human Services. Um, and we want to remind you that uh, tonight is a special fundraiser for Halakipa. Uh, Halakipa is a nonprofit uh, that provides uh, aid for at risk or homeless youth. Um, so, uh, you know, we're asking for a minimum suggested donation of $5, or give whatever you can, um, and, and uh, they will be eternally grateful. I'd like to invite Deborah up here to say a couple of words about uh, Halakipa. Please give her a hand. Hello, my name is Deborah Smith. I am the outreach coordinator for the Youth Outreach Project, which is a part of Halakipa that is also run in conjunction with Waikiki Health. Halakipa has numerous programs um, throughout the state that deal with homeless at risk, um, families in trouble. We have foster programs. They have programs in the school. We have an emergency shelter, transitional living, independent living program. I work for Youth Outreach, which is based in Waikiki, and we provide service to homeless, runaway, and street identified youth. We have a drop-in center four days a week where they can come, have a meal, take a shower, do laundry, get clothing, um, play on the computers, we have GED classes, um, we have lockers so they have a place to store their stuff, and we also do outreach in Waikiki, mostly Waikiki, five nights a week, but we do go to other parts of the island, um, especially if someone calls us and they have a youth that they feel is in need, we will go. We also do try to go to Kaka'ako once a month, um, and that's pretty much what we do. 
Thank you so much, Deborah. Please give her a hand again. So her table is over there. Uh, you can see uh, the, the, the kit that they give out to the youth. You can see where your money goes to uh, firsthand. Um, I'd like to represent. Uh, I'd like to recognize the representative Gene Ward in the audience. Okay. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's take it away, Chad. Thank you, Gene. Big round of applause for Gene Park. He's the man. Thank you, everybody. You know, I want to start with a little personal uh, observation. When I first moved to Hawaii to go to graduate school in the 1990s, I remember three what we probably would have called homeless people back in the 1990s. Maybe we didn't have that word yet. But three people that I could think of in Honolulu that I would see around town. One of them with a shopping cart. And it seemed like that's the way it was for, for many, many years. And after I got out of graduate school and went to work for Honolulu Weekly uh, after the turn of the century, uh, I started to notice a few more. And then, by the time I got to Hawaii Public Radio in 2004, the homeless situation picked up. In particular, in 2006, I was there in Alamoana Park, and I that Luffy Hanneman, the mayor at the time, had homeless people evicted from the park, and we all marched together to Honolulu Hale, and that's when they set up that emergency shelter, at, of all things, at the police station. And of course, it wasn't much long after that that Governor Linda Lingle set up the uh, Next Step Shelter in Kaka'ako, and I was there the day that was open. Nobody thought that eight years later that thing was going to be a permanent fixture, and that there would still be such a, a requirement uh, to house people who are in dire need. And then the final thing I wanted to say is I was driving in uh, from Kaibu Key, where our offices are, I went down the Wild Island, went down Baratania, went down Ward. I probably saw five or six people homeless on the streets, a few shopping carts overflowing, 90 degrees outside, very, very hot, nowhere for them to go, I guess. And I guess this leads to my first question, what the heck happened over these last two decades to increase the homeless population? And if I could, I'd like to start with a comment from the, uh, the state's perspective. Aloha, all of you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I also want to thank Yo, and I uh, want you to please remember them uh, how they keep in the programs that they run. So the question is, you know, we've got a lot more. We, we notice that there are more homeless people. The reality is that homeless people have been here for many years. The situation that you describe presently is one that has been growing. And it is now to the point where people are recognizing it. And you know, when you start to think about things like that, I see that as an opportunity an opportunity to make change happen. And here's the change that needs to happen. I'm going to be brief and really succinct. What we need to do is focus on getting people into permanent housing. Now you say, we don't have enough housing. Well, that's true. But until you can start to get people ready to go into it, until you can say that we are going to qualify people to move into housing and that all of our resources are going to come to bear, to be able to move those people into housing, what we are doing is we're simply creating a system where we're using the fact that we can say they're not ready to be housed as a reason to say that we do not have a crisis of huge proportions. And so the work that we're doing is to really change that conversation. And it's one about creating permanent housing. We've created an initiative to do that for the first time we are using a, a standard assessment tool so that we can begin to triage and understand who are the people who are the neediest. And if you were talking about the 90s, I can tell you what the data that we're collecting is finding. For the first time, all of our service providers are using one tool because previously, if you had asked different service providers to, decide, to tell you who was the most needy, they all would have their own scales. They all would have their own, their own assessment processes but now we have won. And the reason that's important is this, because we want to be able to begin to be able to triage the people, to be able to understand what the needs of each different group is, so that we can start to assess the services that are available for them. Well, let me just uh, push you on that a little bit. Feel free to jump in our other panelists. Last time I checked, the, uh, the average price of a home in Honolulu, Honolulu was, $700,000, is that the figure right now? 
And the average rent between 1,000 and 1,500, which is just astounding to think about that people survive. Uh, how on earth are we gonna have affordable housing? We're right here in Kaka'ako, and the only affordable housing I can think of is Halekavila. But you have all these other luxury places going up with very little allocation for right. affordable housing. So when we say affordable housing, what do we really mean? What is realistic? I don't want to off show here. John, let's go to John. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on some things together. Good evening, everybody. Uh, aloha, uh, John Yang. The, the city at this point is in the process of redrafting uh, or actually creating for the first time a comprehensive housing policy where we get to look at the entire island and, and its needs. Uh, and affordable housing is a big component of that. So when we talk about affordable housing, we're not talking about public housing. We're talking about housing that our average working family can afford. Um, somebody at 80% of area median income is a family of four. They make near 80,000 a year. That's not a bad income. But right now, because of the way the real estate prices are, it's very, very difficult for that family to make it on this island. So what we're trying to do is to find ways within government and also to incentivize private developers to say, hey, we all want to be a part of this because there's plenty of demand. There's plenty of demand so that um, we could actually house those who need it. Right now, we have uh, a big long waiting list, public housing, huge waiting list in, in the affordable rental housing developments. And there's really nothing between those rental affordable housing and the market. That difference is so great that we see these huge wait lists in our public housing market. 10,000 people on the wait list. We have hundreds of thousands of people on other, other private developer wait lists um, for those Catholic charities or EA housing providers. These groups that actually build, uh, they have large wait lists because they just don't have a supply of them. And can I bring your tune okay? Is he, is he hot enough on the mic or should we scoot up just a little bit more? A little bit more. Feel free to get close to that microphone. Don't be shy. Let me go to uh, Jerry, if I could, uh, speaking of waiting lists, you're at IHS, and that's not too far from downtown. Is it realistic that we can actually come up with an affordable housing system uh, to house people that cannot afford the current market rates? Is, is that something you see the city and the state making progress on? When you pose the question, uh, what's up with the, the big increase? I was hoping somebody would take that question up. Well, I'm going to answer part of that. And naturally, part of the obvious answer that most of us in this room have has to do with housing and the cost of housing. That's part of the answer to your question. And it's ironic that we're sitting in Kaka'ako having this discussion because Kaka'ako has pretty much been the crucible of this discussion on Oahu as we're anticipating lots of uh, housing units going in right here in this particular area and all the consciousness raising that's been done around the fact that nobody can afford those affordable units. What I can tell you about the families who live at IHS, 80% um, of the families who live in our family dorm. So our family dorm can hold between 30 and 40 families, which is typically about 130 or 140 folks. 80% of those families are working families. So the most compelling reason for them to be in our shelter is that they simply cannot afford the cost of housing. Uh, Jerry, how many kids are at IHS? That number fluctuates. It depends on who's coming in the door and who's going out the back door. Um, at the most, we have 40 school-age kids at IHS. We have an after-school program, so we'll accommodate sometimes up to 40 kids. At the moment, I think we have about 15, but the school year is just starting, and we know families tend to come in more as the school year ramps up. Okay, so Jason, as far to you, the, the questions are about affordable housing and what happened. The last time I saw you, you were uh, running the Next Step Shelter, now you're at Caravan, uh, Waikiki Health, but I was seeing uh, teddy bears and, and toys and, and evidence that there were a lot of kids staying at Next Step. What did happen, do you think, over the last few years and last decade to make homelessness such a crisis as this today? Well, really the issue and, and challenge that we're having at our shelter and other shelters is the issue with affordable housing. A lot of our families and individuals living at Next Step, they're on housing wait lists for public housing, private affordable rentals. They have some income, some are working families, some have a fixed income of SSI, welfare, uh, social security retirement, but they can't afford the market rent rentals that's out there in our communities. For example, for a studio, when I have my caseworkers, uh, case managers, and housing specialists, 
looking for a place for our families and, and singles, most of the prices out there are 1000 1200 1500 for a studio or a one bedroom. And many of our families and individuals at our shelter are earning less than what the actual market rentals are in our community. Right. So if they can't afford, if they don't even make the minimum rent, then they're, they're gonna end up staying in our shelters. And that's why there's a, a wait list to get into Next Step. That's why individuals and family end up staying in our shelter for six months, a year, sometimes two years because they're waiting to get into public housing. They're waiting for their name to get called uh, at those private affordable uh, rental properties. And, and really the challenge is, is the actual price of, of the rentals. Well, housing first, which the attempt was to get into Chinatown a couple of years ago. In fact, I think it was in the Hanneman administration. And that was shelved largely because of NIMBY, not in my backyard. And we do have to raise the idea that if we are going to have affordable housing, I mean, IHS is an industrial area, although there's a warehouse area, although there are apartment buildings nearby. Are we going to be facing neighborhoods not welcoming, welcoming these folks uh, next to them in these affordable housing units? How do you, how do you address that? You know, it, it, so the question really, uh, it's a tricky question. Uh, I'm intrigued as a reporter. <laughs> you are a tricky reporter, but partly because of the way you set the question up. I mean, the reality is, is that homeless people are in all communities. They live in these communities. Uh, you know, I was born and raised on the Windward side. You know, I grew up in Kaawa, and then we moved into the big town of Kaneohe, right? So we go out every year and do a count. It's called the point in time count. We literally go out and we find homeless people and we count them. And I can tell you that when I was out counting the last time, and every year it's about the same time, beginning of January, here's what I found. I went, I went out to the Windward side because that's an area I'm really familiar with, and there were individuals that I was able to make contact with who were from families that I knew. These were not, these were people from the community who were homeless in that community. And you know, there are a whole bunch of reasons why a human being can become homeless. I mean, there, there are just many, and I like to think of it this way. And if, you, if this sticks in your mind, I'm really happy. The idea is this, every one of us are walking over this abyss that's covered with lahala, lahala, lahala that is weaved together. And what happens is, a hole develops in that lahala. It could be the loss of a job. It could be the loss of your health. It could be the breakup of a significant relationship. It could be a mental health problem. It could be the loss of your sobriety. It could be a combination of all of these factors. But the reality is that when that lahala rips, you fall into this abyss. And the reality is that the longer you're in that abyss, the more difficult it is for all of the people here to pull you out of that. So that is why the policy directive is this. We need to come up with programs that immediately take people out of that abyss and get them stably housed as quickly as we can. Now you have heard conversation here tonight and it's an absolute fact that we do not have a sufficient supply of housing. But where is the private sector in this conversation? Because they absolutely need to be involved. Where are the businesses? They absolutely need to be involved. Our churches, they're already involved. And they provide many of our kitchens and they provide food for the homeless. But we're trying to expand that conversation. Where is so public policy? Involved. In exactly. Public housing is an a big public part policy of it. It's from a big part of this conversation. The you. reality is this will not get solved unless we begin to unless we can establish the political will to do something different. And the something different that we are now doing is we are really shifting how we operate to be able to as quickly as possible get the entire system to focus on putting people into permanent housing. That's the space that we're in. And you might say, well, you know, you can't do it. You can do it. The reality is that if you don't push it, it will never happen. Where's the housing gonna be? And how are you gonna convince developers to make it profitable? We've talked to Stanford Carr, who I believe was involved with the Holly Kavila uh, 
uh, project and others, and he said, look, there's just no money in this for developers, and I can understand churches getting involved, but a developer, let's face it, they're in it for the money. That's what they do, it's profit. How do you convince a developer to, to build affordable housing units, and where do you put them? And I guess I'm moving to you, John. Yeah, so uh, with the city's initiative, this is an uh, initiative that through the mayor, so we have to realize that our mayor, Kirk Caldwell, this is the first time any administration in the city has taken on homelessness and said this is an important community issue, so we in the city must also be at the table and be a part of that solution. And in, in May of last year, we started the, the uh, we had the Homeless Action Plan release. And it was based on a budget that was based on the sale of the city 12 buildings. Those buildings were never sold, we're still in that process. It's somewhere there. But what we were able to do in this past budget cycle is to place in the budget um, $3 million of rental and case management wraparound service uh, money from our, our general funds. This means that in this fiscal year, we will be housing through a scattered site model uh, in the, the three main areas of our chronic homeless populations. And those are areas in Waikiki, downtown Chinatown, and the Leeward Coast. The reason why we chose those, if you go back to that study, shows the point in time count, which hasn't changed much in, in the concentration of the population, that these are the three areas that have the highest uh, individuals and families that are chronically homeless. Our unsheltered populations are in these areas. So we have focused our resources to say we want to house our homeless that are in this area uh, near or in within these areas. Will there be an affordable housing unit in Waikiki? Do you think the tourist industry is going to go for that? The community, the community has already been supported. So when we had talked about uh, in the former administration under Peter Carlisle, they had tried to get a housing first uh, project started in, in the Waikiki area. They were trying to figure out a location. And then the community was supportive of it. When we speak to them now, they want to see it happen. They don't want to hear any more conversation. They want to see it happen, and we're ready to do that now. Okay. Uh, Jason, what do you think? You like that idea of an affordable housing complex in Waikiki? That's where Waikiki Health is. Well, of course, affordable housing anywhere in the community is a good thing, whether it's in Waikiki, downtown, Evel Beach, IL. We need more affordable housing units, plain and simple. And the reason why our shelters are full and people end up staying and living in our shelters is because they're on the very long wait list to get into these private and public affordable housing properties. So, you know, if, if so happens, a miracle happens and, and they create more affordable housing and properties, I'm, you know, I'm sure our case workers, our case managers will be applying our, our clients to these properties. Maybe uh, Kamehameha well, Schools and Bishop State will come forth with some of their land in Waikiki and some of the other trusts. But I, I, I want to make one clarification. We're talking sure. about the scattered site model. That doesn't mean that we're going to have a large... I'm sorry, talking about what? What's that called? Well, we're scattered site, which means that we are able to rent units within the community. I see. So we're not talking about putting a huge development of just chronically homeless. So weaving them in with existing structures and... We have, uh, we have our, our homeless in every community. Finding a unit within each community would be the right way to do it. And it is a national best practice. Okay, and, and maybe I'm being a little too harsh here. And, and Jerry, I'm gonna to go to you because uh, you said 80% of the folks at, at IHS are working and there's families that are there. In the family dorm. In the family dorm. Um, as we all know, when you go to Kmart there, there's, uh, there's Salva is it the Salvation Army or Goodwill? Salvation Army. Salvation Army, there, there's folks sitting or lying on the sidewalk, a lot of folks not looking real happy, and that's a turnoff for a lot of people. And, and what about that concern, that if you do start leaving these units in, a, I hate to keep bringing up the NIMBY thing, but that's what I hear over and over from a lot of people. That's what the tourist industry is saying, you're scaring off tourists. Part of the answer to the question, um, it's not, maybe this is not the time in the program when this would be the topic of discussion. And it's certainly a controversial idea, and I'm sure many people in here have different ideas, thoughts, and certainly feelings about it. But we're having conversations now about people who need homes. And I would like to point out that many of the folks that we see around who are homeless um, had a home. And they came here from someplace far away because this is a great place uh, to make a home, as we all know. Um, and we all know how expensive it is to live here. So part of the discussion about 
finding enough housing for folks is, includes having the, the dialogue and not being in denial about that we have a large percentage of homeless folks who actually had resources, chose to spend their resources to get here, and now have no more resources. Um, I don't have a, you know, a personal strong opinion about whether people should come here from the mainland or not, but I don't think that we're really having the full conversation if we're not also talking about the fact that at IHS, at some points in time, 40% of our men's shelter are folks who have recently arrived from the mainland within the last six months. That's a significant number of people. And many, has, and many of those folks are vets. Art, artfully said, I can see why Connie Mitchell hired you to work at IHS. <laughs> well, let me then go to this next question, which is related. There have been some fairly radical proposals to deal with homelessness, aside from affordable housing. One of them is to fly homeless people back to the mainland. John Mizuno and Rita Cabanilla have pushed for that, but the, the state, DHS, has been reluctant to do that. Another idea is to have safe zones. That's something that Tom Brower, the wife of the rep and others have pushed for, and some resistance in that regard as well. A place where a homeless person can go, get water and sleep, and, and not feel, uh, feel that they're going to be in, in trouble physically. There's also been talk about allowing people to sleep in their cars in parking lots, perhaps government parking lots as well. Uh, are these ideas that might actually help us at least as we try and get more affordable housing units up? Do you think these are realistic? Colin. You know, there was a, there was a proposal about creating, uh, uh, I think a couple of years ago, it was about converting uh, property during the day, converting public buildings at night. And uh, so a study was accomplished in the and the, the issue was really one of just how would you manage something like that, right? How would you, how would you, how would you be able to, to manage a, a project like that? Um, but what we've seen with, you know, so, so here's the deal, right? We have, we have shelters that have unused space now. And the reality is that not everyone wants to live in a shelter who's homeless. And the question will be, you wanted to create something like, like a, a safe zone. The question will be, how is it? Is that how is that going to be run? Is it going to be a, a very low barrier uh, sort of place where anyone can go at any time, or is it going to be something that is really a community-based thing? And what the the data tells us is that something that is community-based, where you simply have sort of like a like a commune where people, you know, have a similar, uh, similar set of values. People agree to a similar set of rules. People agree that they're going to live in a certain way. Um, this last legislative session, I did some research, and we pulled together a whole bunch of Native Hawaiians to talk about the concept of a kauhali, a community center, you know, where, where people would come in. And a really key factor in that is sort of the state of mind of the individual who would want to be part of that, right? Are they willing? to abide by a community sense of rules, or are they not? And I think that if you start to create these other things, my counsel is that you have to do it very, very carefully. Because, and I know Jerry uh, and Jason can tell you this, the dynamics of running a shelter are absolutely just mind-boggling terms of all of the things you have to be thinking about on a daily basis. Believe it or not, one of my favorite, one of the favorite parts of my role at IHS is that I hear guest complaints. And I enjoy, I, I look forward to that because it's an it's a opportunity to build perspective when folks are coming with a problem and a complaint. And a lot of homeless folks need a lot of help getting a little bit of perspective. What I tell folks when they grumble that IHS is sometimes a stressful place to live, I remind them that IHS is an institution. And I remind them that institutional living can be very stressful. And when you live in an institution, you forfeit a lot of freedom, you forfeit a lot of personal space. But whether they like it or not, whether I like it or not, whether a lot of folks who offer a lot of feedback to the media like it or not, it is an institution, and there are things that need to happen in an institution for an institution that serves at-risk populations to be run safely. I would not want to be a clinical director in a safe zone. I'm grateful 
that IHS is a great big building with a lot of cameras and a lot of control, and I'm not a controlling, control freak, but I would be very, very curious to see that social experiment play out. It is difficult enough to ensure the safety, consistency, and well-being of 350 people a night in an institution with plumbing and electricity and primary care clinics and after-school programs. Um, unless somebody had a whole lot of money, a whole lot of time, a whole lot of patience, and a really, really great model, I would be pretty skeptical about how safe a safe zone, how long would a safe zone be a safe place? Safe zones, maybe. And those were some of the very same concerns that were expressed with the legislature, the enforcement, how do you keep things safe. I remember, Jason, when you were at Next Step, and I don't want to bring the shelter up, because I know that you have a new job now at, at uh, Caravan, but I remember a lot of folks simply didn't want to abide by those rules. And you had to enforce those rules, and you had to turn people away. But what do you think? Do you think safe zones or the idea of sleeping in cars? There's a lot of people that sleep in their cars. Uh, maybe have a few parking lots at night time, turn that over, or is that going to be an enforcement problem as well? Well, the issue with safe zones, as uh, Jerry and Colin uh, stated, is how will it be enforced? You have a lot of people who are homeless with a lot of issues, mental health, substance abuse, a lot, you know, a lot going on in their lives. And when you mix those people together with no structure, with no boundaries, with no rules, you're just asking for a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. And, and that's why shelters like Next Step and IHS have rules to ensure the safety of individuals who are residing there. You need to have boundaries, and, and what I learned is our residents, they like the structure. The structure helps them with getting back into the, the mode of uh, daily routine, a structured life, because when we house an individual, they will have to follow that routine, that structure, following the rules of the landlord or rules at work. So, so really, it's, it's a, a test or a, a trial run for them, and in practice, in a way, um, until they get housed or, or employed. Jun, you want to uh, jump in here? You have an interesting role in which you were on the advocacy side, and, and, and now you're uh, working for the city, for Mayor Carlwell. Uh, do you have any thoughts on these issues that we've been talking about, the safe zones, uh, sleep in your car, maybe? Nobody's responded to the fly people home yet question, but that's all right. Flying people home. Uh, uh, Jerry, you mentioned there's a lot of folks, right? 40% at IHS that have that have come recently at times. At times we have that percent now. Okay. No, I want to, I'll answer the flood people. Home. Thank you. I'll just do that. I, um, yeah, I just brought it up. I'm going to let Colin speak to it. No, no. So the, so the deal with the flood people home thing was that, you know, that was queued up. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't work for the Department of Human Services, but it was queued up. And the, the, they made it, the legislature made it discretionary on the part of the Department of Human Services. And the, the conversation about the, you know, so when the, when the state or the city or any governmental entity undertakes anything like that, there are a whole bunch of issues involved. And, and um, what we found is that, and, and we looked at it, and what we found is that a lot of the requirements in the legislation uh, required that the person be safe to travel, required that the person have no, no court holds or no warrants or no, you know, all of these, it was a, it was a checklist of all of the things that the government had to basically certify before an individual could be put on a plane. There was the other factor, which was that we already have service providers who are doing this very quietly. They're doing it under the radar. And when this thing hit the media, and I found out about it because somebody from Huffington Post called me, Oops. and the next call was the New York Times, and you know they wanted, to, they wanted me to comment on it. The reality was that my phone then started ringing People said, where's my airline ticket? I want my ticket now. So we had already been doing this because these two guys at the far end of the table, what they do, a big reason people fall through that lahala, you know, and become homeless is because a substantial and important and nurturing relationship has ended. Something has gone sideways. 
And what they do is they try to figure out how to build that Lahala back by reestablishing that relationship. And they do this under the radar. They don't do it after an article has appeared, which is free tickets home, right? That's the reality of the situation. And sometimes we become our, our we're like our, our worst enemy because by making something so publicized, we really take away the ability of the service provider, Jerry and, and Jason, to be able to do the work that they do, you know. We Why? actually do, since we have, I don't know how Connie Mitchell affords it, um, and it doesn't happen very often, but we do sometimes find the funds to send folks that are in our shelter. There are, uh, it's very common for folks in a state of mental illness to, uh, in a manic bipolar episode, to purchase a ticket and max out their credit cards. And, and in a month, you know, you've got single women in particular coming to their senses in our single dorm and really wishing that they hadn't done that and they've gotten back on, we've had a chance to get them a psych eval and get a diagnosis and get beds. We know nothing about them. We don't know, you know, what type of psych history they've had. So we're starting from scratch to try to see what medications might help them. And those often are the appropriate people for whom those types of funds could be dedicated. And Connie will approve that from time to time. And we do sometimes send folks back. It's not cheap, obviously. But when we know we can do that, and it's going to be a, a return flight that will stick, and it won't be an individual that we'll see back next winter, uh, we'll consider that. So I think that part of the discussion that I didn't have is that there are folks who do come here from the mainland uh, who are mentally ill, uh, who really would be very appropriate people um, and certainly deserving of that help to get back to where they came from, where their support system is, right? Maybe where, yeah. where their lohala mat is. Well, I, you know, I just want to speak on, you know, it's a, it's a controversial issue. So people just love to kind of stick on, hey, you know, are you flying people home or you should, you should fly people home? I, I think that really just, you, we're missing the point here that there's something really exciting going on within our community right now. It's something called Hale Omolama, it's the house of care. It's something that as a community, we've come together, the city, state, the VA, and the service provider network to, to look at how can we house our homeless as fast as we can. Uh, the history of kind of the breakdown of government in being able to respond in a right way uh, happened probably in the, in the last administration with the major economic downturn. Uh, we had to cut a lot of budgets in, in the state. That ended up hurting the service provider networks because the administrative uh, staffing was not available to help and encourage innovation and moving things forward. So we've been working, in the, at least in the state side, they've been working with uh, a lot less staff. From a, a staff of 12 was cut down to a staff of two, and hoping and, and praying that they can move out of crisis. But that crisis mode was continued throughout uh, almost six to eight years here now. What we're looking at now is coming out of that crisis mode and looking at things using data to say we are going to move forward in this, in this direction using data to be able to house those that need it the most and create efficiencies in the system to make sure that these people who we're able to house stay housed and provide the support for them. So through Hale Omalama, we are using the coordinated assessment that Colin had mentioned before, the measuring stick, the yardstick to say, what is the need of this individual and how do I match it with the resources that we have available to us? Because in the past, we threw everything up against the wall and we hope something stuck. You know, you, know, you say throwing spaghetti against the wall. It really was just throw the kitchen sink. And we hope something stuck. And many times, a lot of effort and resources were, were put into it and people, they fell out of the system back onto the street. What we're trying to do is to do things in a smarter way, to be more efficient, more effective, and to respond in the right manner. Resources match with the need, and that's what Housing First is supposed to do for our chronically homeless individuals. I'm really excited to see so many people and so much interest in this room because I know that homelessness is a very important issue for our community. It's also a very controversial issue, but it shows me that you care and that you guys actually, I hope, that you will have and be a part of the solution. Uh, by the way, I've seen a few hands go up and some questions. At 7 o'clock, 
Uh, Gene Park is going to give you the opportunity to ask those questions yourself, so please be patient and we will get to those. Joan, I'm going to stick with you. Um, compassionate disruption, is, is that an oxymoron or is that, a, is that a work of a plan? Mayor Caldwell's, I have the title correct, right? Compassionate yeah. correct. Thank you. Right. Disruption. It, it's, uh, some she folks died. made fun of it, and of course there are harsher aspects of it. We can talk about those so, things. Well, when we, when we, the city, looked at um, access to parks, uh, this was a, a number of years ago, uh, the previous administrations had, had closed the parks at night with no thought that if you close the parks, people would move to the sidewalk. That was not an, even an option in the minds of people. We, I don't know exactly what people were thinking, but closing the parks meant that you know, you're going to move somewhere else so that you'd have more access for everybody, because public spaces are made for the entire public. Uh, it then created this, uh, the situation that we're in now, where we have people sleeping in a, a place that is not appropriate for habitation, the sidewalk, uh, in, in corners, in, uh, in areas that are just not safe. So through the, the bills that passed in the, in the following years, these bills were, were created to encourage the individuals to come off of the street and into shelter. Also to, to provide public access to these spaces. Um, that's what the Compassionate Disruption was supposed to be. It also included, correct me if I'm wrong on this as well, uh, the mayor proposed several bills to, to in Waikiki, not have uh, people sleeping on the sidewalks urinating, defecating, do I have the, the various proposals that were killed, the city shot those down. Although, there, if I understand it correctly, uh, in Chinatown, uh, Carl Rhodes District, there, are, there is legislation in that regard and so forth. Um, is criminalizing, is that criminalizing being homeless and is that an effective solution? And I'm not putting you on the spot, I would just ask everybody, does it work to actually put people in jail overnight or give them a ticket for doing these things, for very understandable yeah, reasons. Things. People are sleeping in, year in, in storefronts and, and going to the bathroom outside. Nobody likes that. Jerry. I think if you have an intelligent conversation about homelessness, you come around to the realization that not one solution obviously fits all types of homeless individuals. Not one uh, intervention or solution is going to solve um, sidewalks versus parks versus cars. Um, one of the ways that I describe homelessness is that it's something that you recover from um, at the risk of pathologizing homelessness. We know that folks can be in recovery from substance abuse. We know that folks can be in recovery from mental illness. And I've more and more come to realize that people, when they're in recovery from homelessness, they're making good choices that mean that they won't be back out on the street. When you talk about recovery, you also then are thinking of the concept of relapse. So an addict who's in recovery will relapse, um, and that will suck. Um, but then they'll pull it together and realize that that's not what they want, and they'll have another period of recovery, and then they'll have another relapse. And the same with mental illness, and I believe the same with homelessness. Hopefully the period of time between relapses becomes longer and longer until you're in full recovery. One of the things that works in recovery is when you have incentives for people to recover and also disincentives. So for a particular group of our homeless population, I think that this disruption that you're referring to represents an appropriate form of disincentive to help to move them along that continuum of recovery closer to, frankly, having more quality of life. Mm, Jason, you want to jump in on this. And I'm using the word criminalizing, but that's what folks like Catherine Gian and, 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 Can and, I ask a question? No, you can't. And Larry I Geller as well. There's a bathroom today. Right. There's right. a bathroom right there. <laughs> if you wait till 7 o'clock, we will have open questions, I promise. Go ahead, Jason. Well, what we're seeing when the police confiscate our clients' uh, belongings is our clients then are pushed back or are taken a couple steps backwards. That's right. Yes. Meaning yeah. their yes. IDs yes. are taken, right. their birth certificates are taken, their social security cards are taken, 
And do you guys know how long it takes to get a birth certificate Without from another yet. state? Do you know how difficult it is to get another social security card if you don't have an ID? Yep. It's nearly impossible. So what's happening is when, when law enforcement so happen takes a homeless person's belongings, their life just becomes a lot more difficult than yep. it already is. Yes, thank you. And they're already going through a lot. It's, it's not easy being homeless. And, and some of the IDs and documents that our, our clients have, service providers like Waikiki Health, like the Caravan Program, they help those individuals with obtaining those documents. So now that person has to go back to Caravan to ask them to obtain another birth certificate from Montana, which could be difficult to even get a hold of someone at the office. And who knows how long they're gonna get the new birth certificate, which means they won't be able to get their welfare or even be eligible for housing because now all those documents that you need for housing is gone. So they're, they're back five, 10 steps. I, I really want to clear this misconception that um, the enforcement team goes out and looks to confiscate people's IDs. They do. There is a process that they go through where they allow the individuals to go in and get their IDs and their medication and their basic necessities. That is the process no, of No, not no, happening that I way. promise, I swear to God they don't do that. We're hearing from folks in the audience saying that that's not the case, that, and we have actually reported civil being more than anecdotal evidence that IDs have been confiscated and it's been very difficult to get that back. Would you not acknowledge at least that it is happening? I know you don't represent HPD, but... And it's not HPD that does it. Who does that? It's, uh, it's through our enforcement team in the... Uh, no. DFM. The DFM is the... DFM stands for? Department of Facility Maintenance. Okay. There's supposed to be so fixing potholes. Now, if the individual is not at the site, the property will be stored. It will not be discarded in front of them. How do they get it back? The, there's usually a tag that... There's always a tag that is left behind and information where they can actually contact us. Is there a time period by which they can get this? That, that I don't know. You'll have to... Can I add one or two things? Yes, you can, Jeff. Uh, IHS has uh, case managers that work in the shelter. They're dedicated to folks who work in the shelter. And we also have outreach uh, folks, just like Jason's crew. Um, folks who don't come to us from the sidewalk for whom their belongings have been confiscated um, require help and assistance and support with replacing those documents just as much as the folks who get disrupted from the sidewalk. So that's a major effort that case managers are engaging in, regardless of whether that person was on the sidewalk or not, because the chaos associated with being unsheltered homeless results in a lot of people losing their important documents, whether, whether they were part of that sidewalk uh, cleanup or not. There is a mechanism for people to get their belongings back, um, and there is unfortunately a small fee and what we have at IHS, our outreach team actually in working together with this department that uh, June is referencing, there's a waiver. And so one of the ways that people can get the waiver so that they don't have to pay, I believe it's $15 to regain their belongings, is they come to IHS and they meet with our outreach team and they get the waiver. We furnish the waiver and then they can go to the impound area um, and pick up their belongings and there's no fee. Uh, we were really grateful that the city and county thought that that was a creative solution because one, it made it possible for them to get their things back. Two, it made it possible for them to get their things back at no cost. And three, it created an interface between that unsheltered homeless person and our outreach team at IHS. So maybe that would be the beginning of a relationship for more and better things to, for, to come. Okay, you know, um, you're experts in the field and I can just tell you, uh, I think we're very lucky as a community to have the four of you trying to tackle this very serious problem. Are there ideas on the mainland that we're not trying here that, that actually might work? We always say that we're different from the mainland and that we're a special place, but are there some things that we, we could be doing? I know housing first, of course, but any, any novel idea that you can think of that you've heard of elsewhere that maybe the transplant here? John. The novel idea, take a person off of the street and place, place them in permanent supportive housing. That's the idea. That's across the board what the nation 
what the Department of, of, of Housing and Urban Development, USIC, everybody is saying that emergency shelter is, is necessary for what it is, transitional housing, but what we really need to do is take the person off of the street and place them into permanent supportive housing and encourage and support that person so that they one day can be independent. And we call that housing first. That's that what right? it's called. Okay. So, you know, the, so the, when I began this, I was talking about our creation of this process, and June is a partner on this process. And actually, we've been on this trail since about July of last year. And it's one of those really kind of special situations we were in. Um, we were able to basically paddle outside, right? I want you to envision a reef, right? Waves are breaking. We were able to paddle outside and catch this wave that was building and became a national initiative in April of this year. We caught that wave in October of last year. And we brought national trainers out here. I invited them, I said, we really need your help. We got some support from people who donated hotel rooms and also figured out a way to get them airline tickets. Uh, so we were able to bring these folks out. They, 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 we have now had four sets of training with this group. And this, our ability to paddle outside and catch this wave early, what ended up happening is it's now a national initiative and 25 cities are involved. And 25, it's 25 of the cities that you would expect to be involved. Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Fresno, Las Vegas, Riverside, Los Angeles, San Diego, Honolulu, Phoenix, Tucson, Denver, Houston, New Orleans. Miami, Orlando, Tampa, Atlanta, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Detroit, and Chicago. Those are the cities that are involved in this. We're being supported by the federal government. What this is about is creating a coordinated intake system so that we can figure out what the people need. It's no more just, you know, these are the services we have. We're going to give you this whether you need it or not. Instead, what we're really trying to do to make life easy for all of our service providers and everyone else so that they can really start to understand who is this person in front of them. And I want to say something about Housing First. Housing First is another way of saying permanent supportive housing. Here's the idea. This is what we're doing. We want to take the sickest people who have been on the streets the longest. We want to house them first. That's, what's, that's what Housing First is. And why do you do that? Because the model that we have described for most people to negotiate, it's like a waterfall. And a salmon needs to swim up this waterfall. And the model that we have adopted, we're not the only entity. We've done this across the United States. These 25 cities are all an example of what we've been doing for the last 30 years. This is the approach. Come into emergency shelter. If you're a strong enough salmon, you get into transitional shelter. If you're a strong enough salmon, you get up the waterfall and then you qualify for permanent housing. For those salmon, those human beings are not the fittest, they will never climb that ladder. And that is why we have created this program that is called Housing First. And the way we are deciding who we are going to accept into this program is through this tool we're using, and people get a score. And the person who has the highest score, who is the most needy, we need to put all of our resources together to get that person out. Now, you're going to ask yourself, aren't these people people who really have some serious issues? And the answer is absolutely. So what we're also creating is a much more effective way of dealing with these issues. And about a year ago, we applied for and we received a grant for, this, for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. They will be funding a pilot. That pilot will begin at the end of this month. And we will be using their services to be able to teach us how to most effectively serve the needs of those people who really, but for our involvement, will die on the street. Here's the other part of the conversation. Those people who are the sickest and who, who really have been on the streets the longest, they are also the most expensive. So what we're doing now which is cycling through our ERs and our 911 system and our jails back out onto the street again, those people are costing us more than simply deciding that we're going to step up, bite the bullet, and put them, and take the resources and put those resources into taking care of them. I want to quote you a statistic. 
About a year ago, there was a study that was done by the, by the Star Advertiser. And in that study, they looked at 911 use. And what they found is that eight of the top 10 users of the 911 services were unsheltered homeless. Number one man used the 911 services 142 times in one year. Mm -hmm. At a thousand bucks a pop, that's a hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. Now, we could have done much better for a lot less. That doesn't count the number of times that individual went into the ER or the number of times that individual ended up in a hospital, which all of us as taxpayers paid. So, does this sound like a business model to you? It is absolutely a business model. This is the model that we're using for those people who, but for, you know, the, they will never, they are not the fittest. They will never make it up this waterfall. And what we need to do is we need to acknowledge that because guess what? The people who are cycling through our 911 system, the people who are getting picked up for misdemeanors with great frequency, the people who are in the ERs, the people who are now in hospitals, it's the same set of people. It's the same set of people. So why don't we just understand this and step up and make the commitment. And I want to thank June and his boss because they have stepped up and done that. The mayor of the city and county of Honolulu has fully embraced uh, Housing First. So has the city council. They have, they have created a program. The state has a Housing First program that we're now running. And we're running this program in tandem with the SAMHSA grant. Because guess what? We're going to have to do a better job of figuring out how to help those people who really need the help. Thank you, Colin. We've only got a couple minutes left. Yeah, a round of applause for those eloquent remarks. I do want to give uh, the other three panelists uh, just under a minute each, if at that, a final comment that you'd like to share. And uh, we'll start with you, Jerry. Your question was, is there something that's happening on the mainland that's not happening here? Well, you don't have to answer that question. And I come to these things, and I, I always make, raise this point, and maybe it's not a, uh, such an important point, because no one ever says, that was a really good point, but I think it's a good point, so I'm going to say it one more time. There's a, there was a social movement that occurred on the mainland that didn't occur in Hawaii, and it was driven by the fact that the mainland has winter, and on the mainland, the social movement was that people recognized that homeless people um, needed to get out, out of the elements, and so there is a level of uh, housing, a strata of the housing market that exists in abundance across most of the mainland. That was created because landowners and property managers and entrepreneurs realized that there was this market of people that didn't have a whole lot of money to spend for housing, uh, but if they could take a building and, and fix it up and make it someplace where it could be a start for somebody or even somebody's home ongoing, depending on what people's personal uh, standards were for where they live, we don't have that here in Hawaii. We have Section 8, and we have a few clean and silver houses that are affordable. So when Colin says, where's private business? Uh, where are the other partners who also have a stake? Uh, that's my question. <laughs> Jason. Yes, and I, I do want to echo what Colin and June are, are saying, that Housing First is really the solution. And, and you know, thanks to the mayor, the governor, city council, and, and we need more of our elected officials at the state capitol to, to really buy in and, and support and fund this program. And really how it's working in real time, it's, it's amazing and, and we are, we're doing this as, as we speak. So how it's working is we have one agency such as Waikiki Health who will help an individual with obtaining his or her documents. Once Waikiki Health gets the documents for this person, then we will pass this individual to another agency, such as Catholic Charities, who will help that person with getting their first month's rent or security deposit. And after that's done, we'll pass this individual on to IHS, who will help this individual with finding an apartment or a house. So it's not just one agency doing all the work. It's really a coordinated effort. And really, with Housing First, it's, it's forcing all the service providers to work together because we do have limited resources and, and when we can help out each other, then in the long run, we can help out more people and house more people and that's the ultimate goal. Thank you, Jason. The last word to you, Jim. 
I think Jason really speaks on, on why it's important for all of us to collaborate. It's, uh, people like to say that those guys are over there, them. But we have to realize that the homeless are our homeless, are our community within our neighborhoods, so that we all have to be a part of that solution. So as our service provider community is coming together and each taking a piece to say that I want to see this person succeed in housing, I think that as a community we all have to do the same and say how can we support this effort, in what different ways can we be a part of that solution. So I, I encourage you and I challenge you, um, everybody sitting here, how can you be a part of that solution? Because we in the, in the government and the service provider community are trying to do this, but we really need your, your help. All right. Colin Kippen, June Yang, Jerry Coffey, Jason Espero. Big round of applause, everybody. <laughs> Reporter Nick Ruby could not be here tonight to handle this conversation. He's on the, the big island in Puna, handing out water with Colleen and Brian, <laughs> and actually reporting on the Senate election tomorrow. So uh, I filled in for Nick tonight. I'm now going to turn the mic over to uh, Gene Park for questions from the audience. I have to go to PBS Hawaii and be on TV at 8 o'clock. So thank you all very much. Gene, you ready? Here you go. Behind Catherine over there, uh, like, like uh, just, just, uh, oh, right over there. That's good. Uh, try, try to be a little bit away from the cameras if you can. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, sir. In just a second, we're going to have we have two questions online. Uh, real quick, we're going to get to. Um, gentlemen, uh, real quick, I have a question. Uh, it should be an easy one to answer. What about arrangements that can be made for homeless individuals' pets? Uh, I'll be very reluctant to give up my pet uh, if I had to get, uh, give it up for uh, to be in shelter. Well, at, at next step, we do allow service animals uh, in in our facility, um, and uh, having pets that's something that we can look into and try to figure out policy-wise how it will work with uh, the rest of the population. Uh, because we do have about 220 people living at our shelter, so we just got to figure out the uh, uh, the health and sanitary uh, sanitary aspect of, of that if we do allow pets. I wish that running a homeless shelter was easier. Um, but what makes it hard is the things that we cannot do. We can accommodate service animals and companion animals when that's a therapeutic pet. Um, but the unfortunate reality of running a homeless shelter is that we simply cannot accommodate, um, for all of the obvious reasons, um, every single pet that every single person might want to have in there. And that's something I wish that I could say that we could do. But whether we like it or not, it's something that we cannot do unless that pet is a therapeutic animal or a service animal. And we have one more question from online. Uh, would it be possible to allow homeless to apply to be resident caretakers of city and state parks, wayside bathrooms, rec centers, and schools, etc.? What are the practical I like that. Obviously, there'd be some fun to require, but basically, like an exchange of a legal place to live uh, while providing some some kind of security presence for uh, from for public uh, places. Well, I would like to talk about a partnership that Next Step has with the state of Hawaii, and that's the Hawaii Community Development Authority. We run a job training program, and at our job training program, job training program, we hire the residents at Next Step to clean the parks at Kaka'ako and Hiwalo. So these individuals are getting on-the-job work experience and they're getting a paycheck, similar to any other employee at Waikiki Health. So when they apply for a job, they can put on their resume that they are employed through Waikiki Health. And what's amazing about our program is we're paying them $10 an hour. So they, they're getting a, a pretty decent uh, wage. You know, I, I'll take that information back to the, the Parks Department and, uh, and see if there's a way that they might have a discussion on it. 
Sir, uh, we'll, we'll start with, or did you want to add something? No. We'll start with you. I know this is a very emotional uh, issue. Uh, if we can just keep it to questions, uh, so we can get through as many people as possible. I can see there's a huge line. Uh, so, uh, so thanks for your cooperation, and gentlemen, uh, please take it away. How much time do I have? Um, one minute. I feel uh, how and Kanye Owe and Kanye three-story, 14 room, $400,000. I've been studying homelessness since I was, I was in second grade. Could you just step a little closer to that mic? Thank you very much. What part did you miss? Not much, just keep going on. I've been studying homelessness since second grade. I'm now 62 years old. I've lived here for 12 years on the island. I bought a one-way ticket here so I could be with my family. And I've been living this life since 1987. And like I said, I built a room in a house in Kaneohe, three-story, 14 rooms for under $1,000. Some of you touched on the things that I believe can resolve the issues. They came a little later in the talk. But we talk about homelessness, and we think of shelters. But homelessness is where you lose it in the heart. And you lose your family. How many of you on the board have lost your dignity? Raise your hands. How many of you are, uh, have lost your dignity completely for over a month? Raise your hands. Until you have lost your dignity, then you don't understand homelessness. But I want to give it to you for everything that you're doing. And you, you touched on the basics. First, before you have the roof over your head, which is important, you need to fix the heart, the mind, and the spirit, and bring them back to where you have pride within yourself. Okay, and I'm sorry to interrupt, interrupt, sir. I just want to make sure you have a question. Well, I have a lifestyle, but that doesn't work. Well, then, I guess, as always, time is too short. Can I just touch on what that gentleman said? He sure. said that um, he talked about the spiritual and emotional and intellectual process that people uh, appropriately need to go through in order to move into a house and make that house a home. And I hear often what I think people have come to recognize as a politically correct uh, way of describing homelessness is to say, well, that person's just houseless. I think a lot of people, you can put a lot of people in a house, but that won't make it a home. So I really appreciate um, because of the hard work that we do at IHS to make sure that people take medication, go to a depression support group, go to a trauma support group, attend substance, outpatient substance abuse treatment, uh, go to anger management, uh, participate in an outpatient program uh, at Queens uh, Center, because that really uh, validates that in order for that person to have a successful home, not just a house, they need help getting those pieces in place. So I'm, Glad that we were able to do that, and thanks for saying that. We get ended in three months. Yeah, what we have here, we, we don't have a housing crisis. We have a moral crisis. We have a, a crisis where we've allowed for 30 years to, to allow the poorest and most vulnerable people to languish in the streets. You know, and you know, you know, we also have we we have a panel of experts that know what to do for us, but never. But I, you know what I just heard? I've been homeless for going on nine years now, and, and what what I, what I hear up here is a bunch of jabberish about the same old stuff and housing first, this and that. But I've been trying to get to folks like you, to tell and some of my other friends to tell you ex exactly uh, the, the way we could, like my friend over there. In three months, we could be a long way of solving this problem. And there's all kinds of ways. And as homeless folks really know how to do it because we're, we, we are very resourceful people because we, 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 we live down in the end. So uh, I ask you, when are you gonna, gonna listen to us? By the way, Mr. Kevin, I'm still waiting for that meeting with you. So, um, I'm waiting. 
So can I have an hour with you so we can have some discourse? Thank you. Captain Jack, um, former Congressional Cabinet and powerful advocate for all of us. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you all being here. And um, um, I'd just like to say, as a service provider, more needs to be done. You all are doing excellent jobs in your own areas. But there is a vernacular here, and I wish Chad were, were still here, that degrades the houseless people and displaced families that are here in the audience. You talked about them being from the mainland, and dirty, uh, violent, mentally ill, drug addicted, and that is not descriptive of right. the entire population. Right. Jerry, you said that 40% of IHS is from the mainland at any given time, and you may be correct, but it's not indicative of the entire population. Right. In fact, 11% are newly from the mainland. So your statistic is not comprehensive. And I'd just like to dispel that myth Okay, there are a lot of myths that just came out. What you're doing with Housing First is great, but the city hasn't offered the full funding for operational costs, so it can't be fully implemented. It can't. And yet you all, except for you, Jason, thank God, you're the only person I've actually seen in Kaka'ako helping the homeless. You still support laws that criminalize, not disincentivize, criminalize those who have nothing. And you reject the fact that their IDs are taken, with the exception of you, Jason. Thank you. Further, you don't talk to these people. You have participated in their dehumanization, which is wrong. And I know each and every one of you are doing good things and are good people right down when you get down to it. But politics is not does not supersede the will and the morality of our community. Hear from these people. Listen to them. Do not criminalize them. Right. The city council is going to hear all of the bills all over again on the 28th. Right. Please do not do that. Criminalization, sit and lie, and the defecation bills do not work. They will increase the, the longevity of their homelessness. We have given you reports. We have given you testimony over testimony, peer-reviewed facts, studies already done in other cities of what works and what doesn't work, and categorically, hold on. Categorically, they say, in other cities who have already made the same mistakes, that criminalizing these poor people, criminalizing poverty, does not work. I didn't care if it's like one district or island-wide. It is wrong, and there's no way you can explain that. And as service providers, if you support criminalization, what does it tell the people that you're trying to help? That is why they are so angry. That is why they question your morality. That is why they think you are full of it. Here, here. Yep. So give them the chance, prove them wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who wants to see happy, well-adjusted homeless folks, you're welcome to come to IHS and volunteer. We have a lot of very happy, un uh, unhoused individuals at IHS. Hi, my name is Tracy Martin. Um, I'm homeless. Can you move a little bit closer to the bike so we can hear you? I live out in Kakaku with my family on a sidewalk. Um, I've been there for a year now. We've gone from being homeless to liabilities to trespassers, now criminals. Uh, what's next, trash? You know, it's like we have a lot of families out there. Right. And we try our best to stay as a community. You know, because we understand that we need to. You know, we need to keep our pride up to get back off the street. Um, these compassionate disruptions you guys do, they hurt us so much. I understand from listening to you guys, you guys don't know what goes on when these sweeps happen. Uh, nobody wants to go buy their stuff back because it's all broken. They have to get all your stuff into a green bin. And the only way they're gonna do that is break it. Right. Why are we gonna pay $200 to go get back 10 poles that's broke, you know? Right. Whatever else, computers, laptops, all that stuff, broken. Personal items, ripped. Sir, what is your first name? 
Tracy. Have you been to IHS? Have you been to the family shelter? Have you come yes. to a My wife has gone with Catherine to check it out. Um, Did you complete the waitlist application, which can be sometimes less than a week before you're able to come into the family norm? I, I lost my ID. I you don't need an ID in order to come to the family shelter on mm -hmm. um, Ka'ahi Street um, and complete the form, which gives us some of the basic information that we need so we can then follow up and have a conversation with you to understand your unique situation. We've got empty beds and the IHS family dorm right now. We have now. two. Cool. One, two. One, two. One, two empty beds. So, please come to the come to I the Kahagi Street Shelter. Help us by completing the waitlist application. And Colleen or David, who are our family program coordinator and case manager. I've discussed that with my wife. On like the many others that have left the shelter. Uh, I'm just I'm sorry. I just I don't want my daughter on bed bugs. So, so I, I run a homeless shelter. You're telling me that you don't have any place to live. I'm extending an invitation for you to come into our family dorm. I've, took, I've taken that invitation a couple weeks ago, and we checked it out already. And what was your decision? Like I said, uh, it's just a big open room with beds, no privacy. You know, I've heard horror. So it sounds like you've made a choice yes. that where you're at is where you want to be. No, it's not where I want to okay. be. I believe, I believe in Mr. Yang's uh, housing first. I know it's going to work, but the truth is, I know it's going to take years before it's That's happening. Right. You know? But until then, this criminalizing homelessness is wrong. You know? Safe zones, yeah. I hear a lot about safe zones. They would work if the community in there policed themselves. Because right. you don't want people to just go to a safe zone and just stay there and hang out and do nothing. You know what I mean? So one thing that we have in common is, I, I wish that you weren't sleeping in Kaka'oko at night outside with your family either. So please hear my invitation. If you would like to try the family dorm at IHS, you're welcome. Come back, check it out. Could yeah, I do that? Could I uh, add something? Sure. Next step, we also would like to invite you to check out our shelter. If you choose not to, start the intake or even apply, that's, that's your choice and, that, and that's fine with us. But if you want to just check out our facilities and see how it's like, I'll personally give you a tour. Okay. And, and you, another... you already owe me a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> you already owe me a paycheck. Because I clean the showers and the bathrooms at Kakaoka Park every day. Well, thank you. That's really nice. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And if you come to our shelter, you can participate in our jobs training program and you can get paid ten dollars an hour, so it's it's something to consider. Consider and another service that we do provide to people living in Kakaako is we allow during uh, from nine a.m. to eleven Monday, Wednesday, Friday, people in Kakaako can come to our shelter to use our laundry services and our showers. So you don't have to live there to use those services. Come check us out. I'll give you a tour, and you can. You can decide if, if you want to come in or not. One story I want to share. Today, someone from the airport called our caravan clinic. We sent out an outreach team to the airport because a family, mother and two children, just flew in today, this afternoon, from Oregon. And what we did was, even though we don't have space, we figured out and found space for this family. So this individual didn't have to complete the application and intake process. We started whatever we could because by the time this family got to our shelter, it was about three o'clock and an intake stops at around four. So long story short, we ended up bringing in this family straight from the airport into our shelter at Next Step. You know, if we can do it for them, we can do it for you and other families. We are flexible. Things are not written in stone. Uh, and, and just you know, try us out and give us a chance. I just want to also speak on the Housing First program. For the state, the, the contract has already gone out and they've already started to house people. For the city, our contract will come out this fall. And we will begin to house people this fall. So how do you guys determine that if uh, you're on a city sidewalk, 
You gotta wait for the city guys. <laughs> it, it, has to do, it has nothing to do question. with a, a sidewalk to, to be a part of housing first. The, the important thing is that an outreach worker has to be able to serve, you know, have the, the conversation with you to be able to do the assessment. That assessment is, is important because it tells what level of need that you might have. Okay, so the families out there, because I hear you guys talking about mentally ill and drug addicted, the chronically homeless. What about the families? Do we have to take drugs to go qualify for that? Because the you guys are forgetting about them. The average length of stay for a family in our IHS uh, family dorm is six to eight months. 80% of the folks that leave our family dorm go into uh, stable housing, and six months after leaving IHS, they continue to be in stable housing. Most, of the, time it's a, most of the time, it's a transitional shelter. But you don't have enough close. space for all the families out there. And it's you're right, I don't. And four days ago, I had room for your family, and today, you're right, I only have two beds. Give it a shot, man. Try it. Well, okay, sir, thank you. We want to give the other, uh, the other people a chance to ask a question, so if, if that's it, please. There's a long line behind you. Thank you so much, sir. Hello, anyway. Uh, my name is uh, Gino D'Angelo McIntyre. Um, I just have just two short questions. Um, I was under the impression that actually you do need an ID to get into IHS. Is, is that true? A picture ID is not a requirement to come into IHS. If that was the case, we would be uh, very empty right now, in particular at our men's shelter. So I'm not sure where you heard that. Um, IHS has an open door policy for clients and for any community members, service providers, potential politicians who want to come and spend time directly in our facility and have a first-hand experience understanding our policies, understanding our procedures, and meeting with our staff. Anybody who has questions or concerns or would like to confirm something that maybe they've heard, come on down. We'd love to tell you firsthand and show you firsthand what actually occurs in a homeless shelter. Thank you. And um, do you think that Bill 7 condones theft from the city? 13-8, revised ordinance um, of Honolulu. Is the, is the, what, allow, what allows uh, them to do the sweeps and to take things from people. And uh, it was my impression that when you take things that don't belong to you, that's theft. So do you think that Bill 7 condones theft? That's what you use. You were on a Bill 7 raid. I got video of you at, on a midnight raid taking stuff from the homeless. I've got video of you at uh, hearing, okay, okay, Doug, testifying okay. for the criminalization oh, of the right, homeless. Doug, we can turn, Doug. Oh, shit, that's stealing. Yeah, stealing. Fuck. That was all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Andrea, please. Aloha. I'm Andrea DeCosta. I just wanted to apologize for interrupting earlier. I know that you actually have a format, but my concern was the same as Catherine's. Jerry, you are outstanding. I just, I so aloha you. I appreciate everything that IHS does and what you do for the community. But we all need to be honest about these statistics. And the reason why is because folks like Colin Kippen are going to go around town and talk to publishers and tell publishers that, and share with them the statistics that you're sharing. Your statistics are specific to your facility, and your facility is outstanding. I wish we had more facilities like yours. We could have a bunch of them in every community. That would be great. But the population that you're referring to was 1% of the total popula uh, homeless population in terms of those homeless people from outside of Hawaii. So I just want to be clear about that. 25% of point in time uh, counts are only one snapshot, one evening, one few hours. The total number of homeless people is actually closer to about 14,000 people, okay? So, so over and above the 350 people that you service and the 40% of that, which is about 1% uh, of the total population, there still is 99% uh, of the population that actually originated here. One of the concerns that I have is that Mr. Kippen has um, been using those statistics, the point in time statistics, and your statistics to quote to publishers and suggest to publishers that 50% of the homeless population, the problem is vets. That is not true. 25% of the homeless population are Kanaka Maoli, they're Native Hawaiians. 
They are from here, they are born here, raised here, most of them, and they deserve a whole lot better. And the second, the second largest population is Caucasian males. That, that doesn't necessarily say where they're from, but we have a lot of Caucasian males who are born and raised here in Hawaii who do find themselves homeless. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on those topics and that's the reason why I intervene inappropriately and I apologize to you and to everyone else today. And I want to thank you, Jerry. So the question that I, that I have to ask, two questions, two part question. First part question really is a follow up to the gentleman who was speaking earlier. I know he didn't have a question and it was really rude of you to tell him to shut up or to, to stop it because that was not your place to tell him, okay? So as a follow up to that, he asked if anyone had lost their dignity for a month. I know because I have been a military dependent and I PCS so many times during my adult life that for that period of time when we're PCSing, even though we have the support of the, middle, the federal government and we know we're going to get a house, for that, even for that two or three week period of time when I'm without a house, it drives me crazy because it makes me feel extremely insecure and all I do is drive around looking at everybody in their homes thinking I can't wait till I have a home. So my question to the panel is, following up on this gentleman's um, testimony, is has anyone on this panel been homeless has anybody experienced a, a situation of being homeless for more than 24 hours? And is anyone in the, on this panel, has anybody stayed in these family shelters for more than 24 hours and, and experienced it the way that the homeless people have to experience it? I think that's the way it needs to be done. I challenge all of you, including Jean, because I think Jean would take this, a week. One week in the homeless shelter for every single one of you. I might add more for you, June, because I saw you on that video and you were, you were taking things just like Doug said. So the bottom line is I challenge you each to this because my sense is that the answer to my question will probably be no. So I'll let you answer it if you want to answer it. But I do offer a challenge to each one of you. Spend one week in the shelter. Spend one week without your money, without your ID. You spend one week the same way that everybody else spends a week, and then you will see how difficult it is. So, thank you very much. So one of the one of the things that happens when you when you try to get your hands around an issue that's as complicated as homelessness is that the conversation about data is absolutely crucial because in a sense, because it's so difficult, you know, we're almost like blind men and elephants, right? You know the fable, right? A bunch of blind men touching an elephant and they touch the leg and they think it's a tree and they touch the side and they think it's a wall and they touch the ear and they think it's a fan. But the reality is that you really need data. And the previous speaker was incorrect. I have never quoted those statistics because I make it a point. If I'm gonna say something, I have data. And there is data, there is data. There. Please, ma'am, would you let me finish? So there is a report that comes out. We have a report that's done. It's called the Homeless Service Utilization Study. It's a, this is it, actually. You can get it online. Um, and if any of you want a copy of it, you can email me. My email is this, C-K-I-P-P-E-N at C-Kippen at D-H-S dot Hawaii, spell out Hawaii, dot gov. And if you want a copy of it, I can also tell you where to get it. But this is a set of data here that literally looks at all of the information that we have. And, and unfortunately, it is difficult to get accurate information because if you're going to be making policy decisions, you need to know, you really need to know a lot about the people that you're trying to serve. And that's really what the folks up here are trying to do. There may be some disagreements about whether you, you know, whether, whether a given policy is correct, but the place that I feel most comfortable and I think is the most rational place to be is to collect data. I also want to hand out to you folks something that we've done. And you know, we've been talking about Haleo Malama, and I don't know how we can do this. Can you help me hand this out? Okay, and if you run out here, we've got some more. Hang on, just make sure, I just want to make sure that's the whole set, yeah. So what this is, is it's simply just a summary of some of the things that we have learned by adopting this system of a common assessment. And what you will see, and this is based upon approximately 750 surveys that we have done using this tool. 
And the idea here is that if you're going to be making decisions, you need accurate information. So that's the space that I'm in. Um, it's an important place for me to be because whatever we do, we need to be able to assess and evaluate that information so that we can figure out how to make good policy recommendations. And then we have a baseline to be able to measure what we do as we go forward to see whether or not it's making things better. That's the objective. I also wanted to make one last comment. You know, again, my model is that we need to create permanent housing. And that will require us to develop the political will to do some things that has yet to crystallize in, in creating that political will. And you know what, if I had to summarize what everyone here said when we did the little, you know, one minute uh, summary before the question started, it's a bumper sticker. It says, all hands on deck. That's literally what we have to do. So you're here because you care about this. There is a much deeper conversation that needs to go on. And in part, that conversation is this. What is the Hawaii you want to live in? Well, um, just a, an answer to uh, a response to the question. Um, uh, this was before I, I actually had a chance to move here. I, I grew up in the Los Angeles area, and, and my father, he, uh, he was in seminary at the time, and he had this crazy idea of taking the whole uh, a bunch of young kids and having them live for the weekend uh, in, in Burnside. This is right after the riots. And so it was uh, one of the first major um, experiences in my life where I had a chance to, to work with uh, homeless individuals and to live in an SRO um, and, and to, to really understand that uh, homeless individuals were just like you and me. And that was, uh, that stayed with me my entire life. And so I think that it has something to do with shaping me as the person that I am today. Um, I really want to just, just go back to, we really need to find the political will, as Colin was saying, in all of our communities to find solutions, innovative solutions permanent supportive housing for our individuals and our families, rapid rehousing. We, we need, as, as all the resources that are out there, your mind, um, your will, to change the way that, that we've been working at this. Our service providers have been working as hard as they can. And what we really need to do is, is to get you know, lift, lift everything together. Next question, can I please remind you all, just please ask one question. I understand that it is a very emotional issue and that there's a lot of backstory uh, in terms of uh, the, the, leading up to the question. But please keep it to one question. There's a lot of people here. Okay, can I just make one statement first? I think we need to clarify our uh, terminology. Everybody's confusing affordable housing with low income housing and traditional uh, transitional housing. And I think we all, especially people on the panel, need to be clear about that, okay, if we're going to lead any kind of discussion on it. Um, I've, when you first started, I, I heard you just defining affordable housing, and June, you had a very good explanation of affordable housing, but it got blurred. It got blurred a lot during the rest of the conversation. Um, but, okay, um, you and I have talked about this before at um, neighborhood board meetings, at the houseless, it, Homeless in Paradise, I forget what it's called, Houseless in Paradise uh, play. And um, we've talked about the stereotypes, and I was dismayed to hear every single one of you put forward the stereotype of, a, of the chronically homeless onto the homeless in general, okay? Because, June, we've talked about this, about the statistic, the percentage of people who fit that description. And you, at, at the house, Houses for Paradise, you, you said you, you could tell me to this I'm minute. I'm sorry, ma'am, you your question. That, yes. I would like to pose the same question to you. What is the percentage of people who fit that description that you mentioned, the, the drug addicted and all that, at this present time? 
Ed. Can you um, please remind me what it was exactly that I said that causes you to think that I made a gross overgeneralization about homeless population? Can you please not interrupt me right now? Oh, I'm now. sorry. I'm trying to understand your question. Yes, but can you please not interrupt me because I'm addressing Jim right now. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm not a very good uh, public speaker, and I'd like to stay on point. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so I'd like to hear that statistic, the statistics again, but what you quoted me both times was 75% of people were not fitting that description, 25% were chronically homeless, were chronically homeless, and 11% of the chronically homeless fit that description. That's what I was quoted twice, okay, from you. And the other, I have one other question for you. Only one question, ma'am, please. Oh, okay, but this one is very important. How many people, have been placed in housing first. How many people have been placed in housing first? Well, uh, you're, you're directing the question to myself. I'm, I'm right, because I talked to you. So the, the, the document that is being passed around right now, if you have it, it actually shows um, what the assessments have been done for individuals on the street. This is the VI SPDAT, and there's a definition of what it is on the front. On the back side, it actually goes into the data that we were able to find. Uh, those that were able to do the assessment, we've done 740 assessments as of this month. And of that, the data is showing us that uh, in the urban region, 37% of those who've been assessed, uh, housing first would be the right housing intervention. That means, by definition, that the individual has been on the street for more than one year or has had four major episodes of homelessness in three years and has a, a substance abuse or and or mental illness, disability. I'm not speaking about the entire homeless population. I'm speaking about the, the appropriate housing intervention for the chronically homeless population. The chronically homeless population, our housing first, permanent supportive housing is the right intervention. That, that partners, that couples affordable housing, rental, and case management wraparound services. If you look at the total island wide so far assessed is 32%. Ma'am, there's no follow up. I'd, I'd like him to answer my question. Okay, can, can I just think? You know, I, 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 recall our conversa I recall your conversation with June. I attended that, that you asked this question, I think, at the play uh, that we were at together. And, and I think, you know, your point is well taken, and I want to make it, I, I want to make it, because I think, I think you're trying to say something here that's important. That there are not, like there are need. not just, yes. you know, there is not one demographic of an individual who is homeless, right? Because there are so many reasons why people become homeless. And they are different people. But at least for what we are trying to do with Housing First, is we are trying, and what our data tells us is that we've got the I'm average. I'm concerned about Housing First. Oh, okay. yeah. what, what I'm trying to say I'm not, is they're not. I'm not all concerned about Housing First. What I'm trying to deal with is the stereotyping that's going on. When I know from talking with a lot of homeless that if you want to know what most homeless look like, look at the person next to you, okay? And then to hear our officials putting out the stereotype of homeless people being oh, oh, that okay, way. I want, to, your point, I want you to tell me. There's someone waiting right behind you, please. No, but he hasn't answered the question. There's someone waiting right he next to you. He knows what I want. There's someone waiting right next to you, ma'am. Yeah? Yeah. I'm kind of sort of interrupting because I feel like, yeah, there is a big, huge um, conversation that's not taking place right now, and, but Colin kind of alluded to that, which is private industry, and I want to specifically, though, call out the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii. I'm just learning a little bit more about them. Um, in business or whatever, as a nonprofit for 163 years, they are shapers of the Hawaii economy today. And we're not looking at that enough at all. We're not looking at that at all. And they have two major programs, military affairs 
and tourism and something else, yes. But they are huge, huge players in our state of Hawaii. And they have shaped our economic system for a very, very long time. There was a time when Hawaiians were at Sand Island and people called out before or at the Japanese um, real estate bubble, whatever, you know, um, for mobile homes, for mobile homes. And the state shot it down. And different types of alternative housing for people who don't, gen you know, walk that walk, that whole gentrification of our state, of the economy. We're not addressing that at all. And Hawaii Chamber of Commerce is a huge player in that. And I would love to challenge you folks, if I can use that word. You're inviting the community to participate. You're the, inviting um, a different mindset. You're inviting a uh, collaborative discussion on alternatives for this. And that's why I'm here calling specifically about what kind of Hawaii do you want to live in? How, how, yeah, that is why I'm here. I'm disgusted. I don't like it. I really, it's like, yeah, time. It, we're in a new paradigm. I want us to be in that new paradigm. And I believe, or I want to believe, that you folks are all there too. You're saying like you are, you know, and some of it, you know, you're doing your part. I'm sorry, Matt, do you have a question? I'm sorry. Okay, so now we have an opportunity for army downsizing, okay? Military army downsizing. There is the possibility of 37,000 military personnel that can be cut. I looked on that website of the Chamber of Commerce and what those personnel, I don't know specifically, but what are the studies? What is the research and development? Why are they, that group, getting 8.8 .8 billion conglomerate in income that is so important to the world that we have to continue on that same trend of economic um, need. Okay, can anyone answer that question? Can you reshape the question? Well, it's a very interesting that nobody can answer that question. And I, I would like to focus on the first part of what I heard you talking about, and I just want you to know that I heard you because, um, you know, on the continuum of working with the, with the homeless population, I kind of consider myself to be kind of in the emergency room, and I get a uh, little bit tunnel vision. And so when I was talking about my thoughts and ideas about safe zones, um, I'm rethinking maybe some of my vibe around that as you're standing there asking that we consider a different paradigm. So thank you for reminding me to not be closed-minded about some alternatives that might be out there for this population. I, I, I wanted to comment on it. You know, so here's here's what's going on. I want to just describe this to you, you know, sort of like with my hands and my, my face here. But the deal is, right? The road that we all have to walk here in Hawaii is extremely steep. Every one of us, right? Every one of us here knows that we have the highest cost of living and that our wages do not keep track. Do not, do not equal what it is you need to survive here, right? And so here it is, right? Here's the road. It's a steep road, right? And so here are what all of these people are doing and all the service providers are doing. Someone has fallen off that road. And what they're trying to do is to put this person back on that road, knowing that that road did not get any less steep. That's the reality. That's why the question that we, which I think precipitated your conversation here is there's a bigger bigger conversation which is what does it mean for us to be living here in Hawaii 
What does that mean? It, it, it really is the essential question because if we can't figure out how to answer that question, the likelihood is that road is going to get steeper. And then right. when people fall That's off that right. road, the difficulty that we will have is how do we give them heart, right? Courage, right? Courage means to give heart. How do we give them? How do we encourage them to get back on that road and walk that road? There's as something steep as it is. there's something called the art of allowing that I'm learning about as well. It's about diversification of humanity and the way we're moving and the way we have moved for the past 20 plus years is for everybody to move in the same direction, to climb that steep hill. Not everybody wants to climb that steep hill. Not everybody finds that very fun or attractive. It's like if you don't have a type A personality, you don't belong. You're houseless. You're homeless. That's what's happening right now. If you don't foot the bill or, or march to the beat of that drum, you're out. You're out because of the economic system, because of the low diversity over here, low tolerance over here. We tried to get bicycles going on. Couldn't even do that. You know how much rules and regulations there are for housing you folks? No. All these federal guidelines that we can't do this, we can't do that. We forget we are Hawaii. Okay, ma'am. We forget All that right. Hawaiians specifically lived in grass huts and now they're living on sidewalks whether they're hawaiian they're veterans they just don't want to do that anymore there's a woman howdy lady okay beautiful person I'm sorry, ma she we don't, we don't chose to live on the sidewalk because because nursing stressed her out she didn't want to work every day as a nurse anymore and i mean there's a lot of pressure in these. We have 14 minutes left in the room. In this world. I'm so sorry behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen and ladies out there. My name, my name is JC Augustine. I'm a candidate for the Hawaii State House of Representatives. And I have a question for you guys. However, I want to give you a little background about myself. I, um, my family actually was homeless at one point. Um, I grew up on the Big Island in Hilo, and my mom was going to school, um, working full time, but she had a hard time making ends meet as a single parent. And we ended up living at Onikahakaha in Hilo on the beach for a period of time. And that experience has made me very compassionate about the homeless population, not only in Hawaii, but everywhere. And I've actually spent time in both of your shelters at IHS and Next Step, as well as working with the homeless populations under the Nimitz Viaduct and at Blaisdell Park and other areas here in Hawaii and other facilities. Um, and I do believe that the homeless issue here in Hawaii is a solvable issue. I believe that it is going to take a comprehensive plan that's going to take not just you folks sitting here, it's going to take private individuals, it's going to take business owners, it'll take all the stakeholders involved, the service providers, as well as the state and city government. Um, with that being said, my question for you guys is, earlier today, I think Chad brought it up when he was still here, was about development, and developers, and that they don't want to get involved because there's not much money in it. Um, I wanted to know what has been explored in regards to giving tax incentives to developers here in Hawaii. Well, we have a, a great opportunity. Uh, this is going to be an interesting response, it's just knowing this community. But we have a great opportunity in the rail, and I really do believe in that, because we have transit-oriented development. Uh, what we have also in the city are, are programs already in place that have been there for a while on the books that allow for developers to get real property tax um, breaks for building rental affordable housing or rental housing for those at 80% of very median income and below. If you build these type of units, you will get real property tax breaks. There are GET incentives. There are um, other pots of money within the state that, have, that people have access to. But what we're also looking at is through this comprehensive housing plan strategy, we're looking at how can we create in these areas more opportunities for private developers to participate in building not only affordable workforce uh, ownership housing, but also um, 
workforce and lower income, 80% and below, rental housing. It is a very, it's a, it's a goal that we really want to push our entire community to be able to, our development community, to provide the supply of housing for those of the people that live here. Thank you. Can I uh, add a comment? Sure. Along the lines of tax incentives, I had a conversation with uh, my father. He's a state senator, Willis Brown, he's actually here in the audience. <laughs> Yesterday we were chatting about solutions. And one idea that he, he brought up was providing tax credits to homeowners who are willing to rent out rooms to the homeless. And that's one solution that he is committed to introduce legislation next, uh, next session. And you know, I, I hope Good. the legislature supports and, 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 and you know, passes that bill. I'd like to kind of follow up on, the, on both those responses. My name, is Ted, a little bit my, my name is Ted Miller. I'm an ex-urban planner. I've worked in housing issues for the past 17 years. I've been a commercial uh, multifamily broker. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of uh, statistics to set up my question. Uh, the states with the highest rates of homelessness are Hawaii, New York, and California. States with the uh, greatest affordability problems are Hawaii, New That's York, right. and California. Thank you. The average rent in in uh, Honolulu today for an apartment is roughly twenty-two thousand dollars a year plus utilities. The per capita income is roughly thirty thousand dollars a year. Those two numbers are converging. That's a recipe for dramatic levels of homelessness. Of roughly one third of the um, of the uh, affordability problem we have is due to the fact that we're on an island. The remainder is due largely to the land use, zoning, and development decisions made by uh, the Public city and county of Honolulu over the past 20 to 30 years. There we go. And I'd like I could sit here and actually rattle off numerous policy changes that would make a significant difference in the private sector's ability to provide affordable housing. When I, don't, I don't mean subsidized housing. I mean housing that's affordable to local people. But I'd like to know what kind of new policies you're working on right now uh, to do that same thing. Very Thank good you. question. Thank you. I have a just a brief comment on that, and that is, um, We'll be bringing that up at City Council to discuss this with our City Council members because right now it's in draft form and we'd like to be able to do that in the, in the correct forum. So I'd be interested in sitting down with you uh, to discuss this a little bit more. But um, I'd encourage you to, to wait. The news is coming very soon. Very soon. Okay. Can't so one of the, I, I wanted to also take a, uh, you know, I think your point is really well taken, right? Uh, cost of housing is very high. One of the things that happened this last legislative session, I want to thank the legislators who are here, is they changed the amount of money that is, goes into the rental housing trust fund from the conveyance taxes. And that is now at 50%. And that has increased the amount of money that will go, go into the funds that can be used to build affordable housing. Uh, I'm not, I mean, that's a step in the right direction. We need more. I want to also give you uh, a little, I'll let you know that there's some things that are going on. Uh, so I'm the chair of the Hawaii Interagency Council on Homelessness, and I have a group that does affordable housing. That group uh, has, set up a, has set up a working group, and what we're looking at are micro units, trying to build smaller units. And you know, it's quite the rage, right? It's the rage in San Francisco and New York City, um, and also in Seattle. And so these are much smaller units that are planned in a way uh, that the per unit cost is reduced and of course the construction costs here are very high for a number of reasons and we all know that. So that's an initiative that's going forward. There's also a conversation and I, I know the man is here, uh, uh, Don Crisimano is here and I know, I know Don may want to, I don't know if he's in line, but he has been working on, on trailers, you know, being able to convert mats and trailers and there's a conversation that's now developed and in fact what's happened is the uh, Honolulu Community College is now working on a proposal to see whether or not they can retrofit a trailer to be able to use, to be used, and that's a that's something that is ongoing now. Honolulu Community College is working on that, so we're trying to 
we're trying to look at the, the kinds of housing that we might be able to build for a lesser, lesser cost to be able to, to build some things. Thanks. I just talked about, you know, converting a trailer into a home. Why not just, what, what's the city and state doing to um, help bring mobile homes? Wouldn't that be a solution? At this, at this time, mobile homes are not allowed on this island. Okay, uh, why? <laughs> that's the question. I'm to the point. Yeah, good question. That, that's, you know, we are looking at all the different housing options, as in containers. We're looking at the uh, possibility of modular housing. We're also looking at uh, Ohana dwelling units and changing you know, the, the rules behind them, uh, accessory dwelling units. We're looking at um, micro housing, and and there there are things that people don't realize. The the zoning minimum for uh, the, the ordinance minimum for a housing uh, dwelling space is 70 square feet for an individual for a room. We're not talking about making a housing unit 70 square feet, but we when we're talking about micro units, making complete units a little bit smaller and being able to provide a little bit more uh, affordable housing or workforce housing, that's something that we're looking at. So thanks for not answering the question. Uh, I've just been informed that we can't run until 8.30 uh, for the benefit of anyone who, who hasn't been able to get any, uh, questions asked. Uh, we will cut, cut it off with the, with, the, with the lady in the back right there. Uh, so she'll be... Uh, are you the last one? Yeah, so, so you'll be the last person to ask a question. So go ahead, man. My question, let me just bring you back to uh, last week. Closer. Over the past weekend, we had a hurricane scare, right? Um, yeah, I live in Kaka'ako with my family. I'm homeless. My husband had been waiting for a hurricane to happen for a very long time because it'll just wake up everybody who doesn't have their houses prepared for a hurricane and about how many homeless would you know pour into the Kakako area or in Honolulu in fact. So my question is are you guys ready if a natural disaster was to hit? Good question. That's a great question. It sure um, is. First of all uh, I was in the Kakako area um, as the emergency shelters were opening Yes. Um, and I was talking to your husband yes hoping that he would get on to an uh, evacuation bus because I was as concerned as you are about the families that were in the area. Um, there were many families that decided that they did not want to leave. Yes. Um, actually, there was about 57 individuals in the area that did not leave, um, including children. Um, and I was very worried for their well-being. No, I understand. Now, so when we're talking about if an actual island-wide disaster were to happen, mm -hmm. if people, when they, as the disaster were approaching, would take the evacuation transportation, our shelter, our evacuation shelter space could have taken them. Yeah. I, our, our city responded in a way that it's never had before, mm -hmm. where outreach workers, starting from Monday, started contacting and letting homeless individuals around the island know that there is an pending storm, a hurricane, on its way to the island. And as they went to outreach, they encouraged them, as the news comes, we will be letting you know when the, the, the buses will be coming by. Right. And for areas that our outreach workers could not reach, we had our community policing team from the police department go out to these areas to let people know that there is a storm approaching, and we did everything that the city could do, together, partnered together with the, the outreach community to do so. If the storm had come, and people had taken the transportation to these evacuation shelters, I believe that they would have had the shelter space to take all the individuals in. All that is true, but what I'm trying to get at is, all those stubborn individuals that didn't want to go on those, you know, evacuation buses. You know, why wasn't a 
a better effort made because my husband had stayed back because he wanted to you know, persuade these individuals to go seek shelter. In the, in the same way that we cannot force individuals into emergency shelter or into the state hospital or into anything else, we cannot force people to get off of the areas. If people during, if you remember images of the tsunamis coming in over the past number of years and individuals going out into the water, it was on their own. And the police cannot stop an individual and force them against their will from doing so. Right. It is the choice and we and the police, while I was there, they had gone into the area because I was there for three hours. Yeah. They circled the area and let everybody know, over and over and over again, letting people know, get on the bus, because the bus is for free, the bus is coming by, and it'll take you to the shelter. Mm -hmm. There were people that took it. I watched them, I helped them get on the bus, and there were a lot of people that didn't. Okay, so my question again was, would you guys be ready for a natural disaster if it was to hit? Right. Well, I can speak for Waikiki Health and Next Step Shelter. We, we evacuated our shelter, and how we evacuated our shelters, it, would, it ran very, very smoothly. We partnered with uh, Robert So White, and they sent four buses to our shelter and picked up our residents. And, and we evacuated our shelter without officials telling us that we had to leave. We decided we'd rather take the safe route rather than be sorry and, and, and waiting until 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. when the storm had set and we have to evacuate. So, so we ended up picking up, Roberts White ended up bringing their buses, transporting our residents to McKinley and County High School we inform our residents about what to put in their emergency bag so that they could be prepared for overnight. And, and thanks to June, we also you know, got information about the routes for the city buses. So, so for those who, were, you know, who live in Kaka'ako, myself and a team went out to notify those individuals about the route, where to wait, what time the buses were coming, and I agree with you, some people went to the shelters, other people were stubborn, they didn't want to go, and that's, that's their right. Uh, I'm about but to lose the shelters, power, uh, you know, in we case were we cut out. And, and, you know, thanks for uh, the help from the city and June at, at the mayor's office. Thank you. We're fortunate because the family shelter at IHS, the single women's and family dorm on Ka'ai Street, is actually a designated Red Cross shelter. Um, we have a generator at that shelter. We additionally have a very large generator, a men's shelter. Uh, we sheltered in place uh, for this storm. Uh, if the plan for our men's shelter, should we need to evacuate, would be to follow the, directive, the direction that would come from June's office, and that's what we were prepared to do if we had to leave our men's shelter. Um, but our, again, our women's and family shelter um, is actually an identified Red Cross shelter um, in the event that people who needed to take shelter in that area needed some place to go, so we're fortunate in that way. I just wanted to answer that as well. You know, the, the plan was for people to shelter in place unless you were in an area that was at jeopardy, right? Low-lying areas, areas prone to wind. And uh, of course, the difficulty is that if, if you're homeless, you're sheltering outdoors, right? So you don't have a place. But I want to tell you what ended up happening. And, and the, the way the model works is that the state coordinates of the counties and so June was part of a team at the county and literally you know this thing was supposed to arrive at the end of the week we were talking you know as soon as it was headed our way and so he was coordinating with his team coordinating with civil defense coordinating with the buses coordinating with the police and really that's that's the way you do it and I thought it was I thought it was well done I, you know you don't ever want a storm to hit uh, uh, but I think that in this particular case, we were ready for it, and the way that it went, I thought was very, very smooth. And I, the last time we had a tsunami warning, which was what a year and a half ago, we had the tsunami warning. This, this was much improved over that because we just realized that we all have to get together and really uh, coordinate and work with each other, and that's what happened. Thank you. 
Thank you. I have, a, I have a question for Twitter real quick. Uh, has any of the homeless data that you've all collected uh, on the city and state side, has, has it ever been uploaded online to data.hawaii.gov or data.honolulu.gov? Uh, and if not, would you guys consider it? Great question. I, I would like that question answered too. That'd be great. Yeah. So um, most of our data comes through the homeless management information system. Um, there's a lot of private information. So that data, I'm, I'm not interested in, in putting into um, that data server because we're talking about individuals, identification, and, and a lot of things that should stay private. Um, but for our information statistic-wise um, and studies that we have, point in time count, homeless service utilization reports statewide, these are all um, are available, easily accessible. Just by doing a Google search, you can actually find them. Uh, if that information wants to be placed up on, on this data.org, then I think have at it. We have some of that information up. I haven't checked it recently, but we have that information on a, on a website, and I think it's really important. But again, this is, the, this is one of the studies that June referred to, and the other is the point in time count. Hi, gentlemen. Um, I want to commend you all for being here this evening. I know this is, kind of feels like you're being grilled a little bit. Uh, but I think, you know, one of the things that we've known for a long time here in Hawaii is that families have had to double up, triple up. You've got multiple generations living in households, not because they want to, but because they have to. We've seen this, we've known this for a long time. We knew this problem was coming, okay? It wasn't like it just jumped up one day and bit us right. out of nowhere, right. okay? And the problem is that we're, today we're being reactive to a problem that we knew was coming, but it's gotten so bad now that we have no choice but to respond. Right. You know, it isn't like, okay, one day we just woke up and said, okay, here we are, we got a big homeless problem, we knew this was going to be here. But my challenge is, is why weren't we doing something about this 10 years ago? Right. Because, you know, this continuum of, of where we're going in terms of what we're able to earn versus what we have to pay to live here, that rule isn't changing. Okay, that statistic is going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. Okay, that means we've got to make some serious and profound changes to the way we do business here in the state today. Okay, um, that means policies have to change. That means the ability to develop places and develop new properties that people can afford to buy or to rent need to be the priority. It needs to be priority number one. Yep. What we've got going in Kaka'ako today is a crime. Yep. Okay. Yep. We're building multi-million dollar properties for people who can't even live here. Okay. These properties aren't going to be bought by us. They're going to be bought by people in California. They're going to be bought by people in Asia. We can't okay. afford them. Can anybody here afford them? No. no. Okay. So, what we need to do is really go back and reassess the way HCDA makes decisions about what right. kind of properties are going to be developed here in Kakako. The people who live in Kakako want to, want to have the way of life that they've enjoyed over the years. That's the way, of, that's the way they want to live their lives. This does not facilitate that. Okay? So we really have to go back and take a look at the way we make decisions about and the process that we're utilizing to build these structures. And, I, and to tell me that developers have to build six million dollar properties in order to make a profit? No way, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was an investment banker, I know what it takes, and I also know that they pad the books when they build these projects. There's a lot of profit built into them when they do their estimates. I know that for a fact, because I used to do this kind of work too. Okay, so I know. Now, I want to offer just a simple solution, I want to get your feedback on it. One of the simple problems today was people lose their IDs, their stuff gets confiscated, their meds get picked up, okay? Why can't we just have lockers, small lockers, someplace, and maybe we work with the YMCA or we work with the Waikiki Hill Center and build a small structure or add on to structure school lockers where people can keep their important stuff so those things can be in a safe place so they don't get confiscated, so they'll always have them when they need them. I don't think that would cost a lot of money. I think it's a very simple solution. I agree with you. I agree with you. They're very popular on the mainland. Yes. Uh, that not all cities have them. They're often part of what's called a hygiene center where folks can come and not only have a place to store their things but also have a bath and do their laundry. 